Thank you for watching this sermon from Kings Park International Church. Be sure to check out the other sermons in this series as well. This past weekend, we had the opportunity to celebrate 40 years of global ministry through the tireless work of our Bishop, Ron Lewis. Our global family had a unique opportunity to fellowship, celebrate, and reflect on the legacy of Bishop Ron Lewis as a friend, father, brother, and teacher to countless lives. Praise God. Let's give God a great hand while we're up to. He's worthy of all our praise, all our worship. Well, all right, it's so great to be back here. I have my wife, Kathy, with me. Raise your hand. And we were part of this church for a number of years. My first visit to this church many, many years ago, we were behind Bojangles. That's when it was Triangle Christian Fellowship. In fact, every time I come, I have a Bojangles in honor of that moment and celebrate it. In case you're worried, I had one this morning. Okay, hold one here. Let me do my biggest technical thing today and open my iPad. Holy Spirit, help us this morning. We thank you that you're here. Lord, through this church, churches have been planted around the world. Churches that have produced hundreds of other churches. Thousands and thousands saved. Lord, some of my greatest moments are involving this church. Speak to us, Lord. Amen. I woke up at four in the morning, uh, Friday, and I had no message at the time. I had a theme. In like 60 seconds, this message was dumped from the Holy Spirit into my heart. And I like that because I've never preached it before. So I believe it's in particular for you at this time and for the body of Christ. Pastor Ron and Reggie and I had talked a bit about 40 years as a generation, and we, we thought about like not just about Ron. Ron asked, like, what would God be saying to the next generation right now? So I'm going to entitle this message, Possessing Our Promised Lands, Learning to Walk in a Different Spirit. Numbers 1424 says, my servant Caleb had a different spirit, where almost everyone else was gripped with terror by giants. He and Joshua, their families, Moses, the only ones with the courage, he had a different spirit. He followed me fully, and I'll bring him into the land. I want to start by talking in a moment about our place. Like, where are we prophetically? What is happening? Then I want to take you through where I think we are, and how can you allow God to develop in you the spirit you need, the heart you need, to fully possess not simply everything God has for the body of Christ in the world or KPIC, but your personal promised land, your calling. Just take a moment prophetically to go back and just place us. I have to go all the way back to December 31st. You've heard me say it, but that was my first glimpse of what was coming on the world, 2018. A New Year's service at our sister church there in Brentwood, Tennessee. Brentwood Church, Brent, uh, Bethel, sorry, Bethel Community Church. It used to be Bethel World Outreach. I think now we're Bethel Community. Anyway, there we are. And I was doing our New Year's Eve service, and it was the happy New Year's message became the unhappy New Year's message. It was that night I saw the nation shake, convulse, people screaming, just pain, 
people leaving the West Coast, New York just crushed by something. I, didn't, I, I couldn't even respond as I sat there. I have kids in New York, kids in the Bay Area of San Francisco, and then Pastor James was introducing me. And this thing about 17 months, 17 months was on my heart, and I, and I stood up, I talked about what I'd seen, and I said, in 17 months, once again, God will come to touch America's ethnic pain. There'll be such polarization, such pain in the country, such hatred that people think America's gonna end in anarchy. God says you'll, it, America will end in revival. Of course, 17 months after that, that, that very thing began as the nation was just torn as God tried to heal, and began to heal our ethnic pain. Like, what would God say to us? Some months later, it was June 6, 2019. And I, and I came into a period of time when I was just dreaming all the time. And I saw pain and people dying and all these shakings coming to the world. I, I could hardly just comprehend it. And finally, after one dream, God brought me into Deuteronomy 2, 13 through 18. And that's an interesting place. I knew that God had told Moses, cross the Red Sea by a miracle, cross the Jordan River. We'll talk about that today. But in Deuteronomy 2, 13 through 18, God said, cross the Zered Brook. They'd been in the wilderness 38 years, and now they're gonna cross the Zered Brook, which speaks of outreach, growing, fruitfulness, into a two-year period of time, which would bring them to the Jordan River and cross over into the Promised Land. It was a time of fighting, battling, leadership transition, great stress, great duress, closing in a terrifying pandemic, which killed thousands of them. It's a two-year period, and I stood in front of our Every Nation family, said, we're crossing this Red Brook. This is what's facing it. Whether it's two years or not, I don't know, but it will bring us to our Jordan River and we'll cross over into our promised land. It was about two and a half years. So here we are today, and God has called us to cross over now into what I believe will be one of the greatest seasons of revival in the United States and in the world. You'll see hundreds and thousands of people saved. You'll see America gripped with the fear of God. You'll see a polarized, broken, hate-filled America that demonizes one another over ethnicity and politics. You'll watch the Spirit of God sweep in. Now, it's interesting, when you look at this, when we come to this point, when you look at Israel, by the time they got to, think about this for a moment, by the time they got to the Jordan River, out of the generation that had left Egypt, only two men and their families had survived. Not everyone had made it. And so I wanted to ask, why did they survive? If Joshua and Caleb were standing here today with their families, and you asked them, how did you make it into revival? How did you make it into the miracles of the promise? How did you make it when every one of your friends didn't? How did you make it where every person that mentored you did not? How did you make it when most of your relatives did? Like, what was in you that enabled you to stand here? Caleb at 80. Joshua in his 60s. How did you make it? You're the oldest men left living in Israel. Moses didn't make it. Miriam didn't make it. Aaron didn't make it. Her didn't make it. How did you make it? We stand, and hear me now, on the cusp of an outpouring of the Spirit. And it's not just something like, okay, where is it going to be? It'll be right here. Oh, you'll watch. I'll never forget in July, some years ago, walking in, it's when the Holy Spirit whispered to me about Reggie and Bomi one day leading this church. They were sitting right on the front row where they are. I was in the back when I looked at them. The Lord told me that same day, I will come and flood this church with my spirit when they're pastoring. And I will bring hundreds and thousands of young people to this place. Like, how do we walk in that, beloved? And basically, what's very interesting here is that when they crossed over the Jordan River, Joshua picked 12 men, one from each tribe. He said, I want you to go back into the Jordan and get 12 big stones. And I'm gonna build a memorial right here. And for all of time, men and women will bring their children here and say, that is a memorial to what God did. 
When they ask you, Daddy, how did you cross that Jordan River? You'll tell them. When they say, Mama, how did you all possess this land? You'll tell them. So I've pondered this. I think there are 12 things that can be said. I'll say seven of them now. Number one, if you're going to come into everything God has for you as a man or woman, your personal promised land, promised land of your family, the best of God, you must learn to play injured. How many of you know life is injurious? How many of you know life is just filled with trauma? Imagine the trauma in Joshua, the trauma in Caleb, They'd watch plagues kill thousands, terrifying battles, people dropping dead. They'd lost almost every important person in their life but their children and their spouse. Imagine if the plague that hit America, COVID, would have killed 200 million Americans. What if it would have devastated, leaving you one of the only left alive? When you look at the trauma in scripture, the pain, look at the trauma of Joseph betrayed by his brothers, thrown in prison unjustly and forgotten. The trauma Jesus went through. May I tell you, life is no easy matter. Life is filled with trauma. Many of you have a life loaded with trauma. I sat with my mother, she buried Three sons, I'm the last living one. She's 91. My dad died of a form of Lou Gehrig's disease. She's filled with joy, filled with God. I go, Mama, I feel sorry for you. You've suffered. She goes, what suffering might you be talking about? So filled with joy, she said, I would not trade places with one woman in all of history. May I tell you, I believe in therapy. I believe in counseling. It is a fine thing, but sooner or later, you can't wait to be healed. You must play injured. In fact, your part of your healing is playing injured. It's a world filled with trauma. It's a world filled with pain. There's plenty of trauma. I spent much of my time counseling trauma victims. But may I tell you this? If the characters of scripture would have waited for their trauma to be healed, there'd be no Bible. Terror, rape, murder, enslaved. And there were no therapists then. There were no counselors then. Pastor Paul said, I was stoned, I was left for dead, I was betrayed, I was imprisoned. But God's strength was made perfect in my weakness. Beloved, I've had plenty of trauma. And so has Kathy. I've had terrifying pain and things I faced paralyzed, weeping, wanting to quit. But this is what I've realized. My healing is not in waiting. My healing is in going. Don't wait for the perfect. Well, if I just had this fixed, I'd do it. If I was just healed, I'd do it. If my marriage was just a bit better, I'd do it. You may be waiting forever. They learn to play injured. Life will injure you. This isn't heaven. My mom and dad looked at me and said, listen, the world is very hard. Don't expect heaven. You won't get it. It's filled with tribulation. Walk with God. Build a family. You'll go to heaven one day. This isn't heaven. That's why we're here to bring heaven. I just want to be happy. A great Christian looked at me. She goes, every person has a right to happiness. I go, no, they don't. If you're waiting for happiness, I'm happy for you. You may never get it. You'll always have a troubling circumstance in your life. Joy is God's promise, not happiness. Can you play injured? If you can't, you won't play much. Can you witness injured? Can you invite someone to church injured? Can you, oh, I'm depressed. Me too. I want to quit. Me too. But I have determined in God, no matter how I feel, God's word is true. I won't quit. I will serve, I will show up, I will come. And if you want a litany of pain, I'll invite my wife up and we'll share our pain. But I'd rather share my promise. Secondly, they learned to walk 
by faith. Life comes down to two simple choices. They're placed before you in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You will walk by faith or you will walk by sight. There's no in between. You will live your life either by what God says or by what you see. And one of the reasons that Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit, you have to go all the way back to Numbers 14, 5 through 10. They'd gone into the promised land. Man, it was filled with milk and honey. It was everything Moses had described with one small caveat. There was a race of monstrous giants who had never been defeated. And everything they had promised was walled off. And 10 of the spies said, man, it's a land with milk and honey, but we are grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way. Caleb Joshua said, This is what God has said. They're bred for us. This is the promise of God. This is the way you will live your life. If I live by sight, I will quit. I have believed for so many things with absolutely no evidence. No evidence. I am believing for things on a personal level, in a corporate level. No evidence. We celebrated Ron Lewis. His life is a testimony to playing with pain and walking in faith. I was with him when he buried his precious son. I watched him plant New York City with some of the greatest personal pain I've ever known. You will live by what you see or you'll live by what he says. Take your choice now. It is a simple choice in life. What you see will deceive you if it's contrary to what God is saying. Now, I don't deny reality. When they told us some years ago, many years ago, we were living here in North Carolina, that Kathy's cancer had gone into the brain. I didn't deny reality as I drove back to my four small children. God said, stop praying. I said, why? It's a waste of your time. I said, that's scary. He said, she's healed. I never prayed for her to be healed again. He had spoken. The next one, they go, if she had cancer, it's gone. We have no answer. You will live by faith and you'll live by faith. Let me tell you this. He told Joshua, this verse is so helpful in Joshua 1.8. This book of the law must not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you'll have a prosperous way. He said, Joshua, the battle's not in your mind, it's in your mouth. That war in your head, that that child's not gonna be healed, not gonna come back. There's no hope for your marriage, no hope for your business. The battle's not in your head, it's in your mouth. No matter what my head says, no matter what my body says, I will confess what God says. I will rise up every morning. My weakness is turned into strength. I will rise up every morning. Abraham did not consider the fact that his body was as good as dead. He did not consider the fact that his wife was long past menopause, but he was persuaded that God could do what he promised. The battle's in your mouth. It's the rudder of your ship. You confess God's word in the face of hell every day. Life's hard. And you happen to have been born in a very hard time. It's just the truth of it. The shadow of nuclear war hangs over us. Economy shattered. People starving. The worst political polarization in America, not since the 1960s. I lived through that, probably the 1840s. In the middle of it, what do we do? Cave in to fear? Like, beloved, what did you expect? Did you expect America was just going to ease into revival? Did you expect that our nation wasn't going to get desperate? Thirdly, Are you walking under the authority of God's word? You see, Moses understood it. He said, today I've set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He told Joshua, Joshua 1, 3, and 4. This is the very land God's given you. He gave it to Abraham. He gave it to me. Every place you put the sole of your foot is yours. Let me just tell you right now. 
The word of God is my authority. What's your authority? The average Christian, their authority is their feelings. Oh, it just felt right. I had a great young man tell me, oh, you know, I, I know probably, you know, that man, you know, she's, she's got her own orientation issues, but, you know, she just seems so happy. It's got to be right. Your feelings do not determine truth. How happy it makes you feel to sin. Listen, I had another biscuit this morning. It made me happy. may not have been right. <laughs> Let me tell you, your happiness is immaterial to God. You'll be happy in heaven. Be joyful here. Oh, I'm happy. Oh, if it feels good, do it. Oh, they're just expressing themselves. My authority is not my feelings. My authority is not my wishes. It's God's written word. Where's your authority? This God who by faith I believe when he spoke, he spoke into existence the very processes that this world resulted from. I believe that. I believe that word. I live under that word. It's unquestioned to me. This is what the Bible says. And you start picking apart that Bible. You start thinking, well, that may really not be true. You'll end up with no authority blown by every wind that's tormenting our culture. For learning to live in the secret place of communion and intimacy. Why Joshua? Like, what made God choose Joshua? Like, what was it? How did that happen? I'll be 68. Kathy will be 67. I've almost died. She's almost died. We fought for kids to live. I mean, the doctors have given up on our health. We have a wonderful marriage. We're different. Why? I guess you're just compatible. May I tell you, how many of you know no humans are naturally compatible? We're mean, cranky, and selfish. It's just a fact. Two fallen beings are never going to be compatible. You may be attracted to one another, but you'll wreck that within six to eight months. Like, how does that happen? Exodus 33, 8 through 11, that whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of the cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak to Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of the cloud at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, when Moses turned again to the camp, Joshua stayed in the tent. Joshua got mentored. Moses told him, he said, son, what happens outside that tent is what's determined by in that tent. And if you don't have your own tent, if you don't live in that presence, if you don't draw close to me, nothing else matters. It was outside the camp. You realize outside the camp, that was a really big deal. They believe that was the demonic area. That's where they, that's where they did capital punishment. That's where they sent out the, the goat with a sin offering. In the middle of warfare, in the middle of battle, where not a lot of humans trod, do you have a tent? If all we know of you is what we see, I'm afraid. Is there an inner life? My God, in those days, there was no written word yet. The Holy Spirit was not living in them, yet there was presence, and Joshua began to learn. If I don't spend time in that presence, if I don't spend time with God, if I don't come in that tent, I'll never have anything outside the tent. Beloved, listen to me. In the end, your inner life determines everything. Do you hear him? Do you know him? Do you speak that word? I can't make you, but I beg you to do it because that's where God really looks. Jesus said, listen, the Pharisees are doing it to be seen of men. I'm looking at what's done in secret because what's done in secret. Oh, I, before we came into this, this COVID thing, I was sitting in September 2019 at a prophetic conference in Maui. Kathy was there, Reggie Bomi, we're all there. And um, it was the night service. I got back late and the Lord came to me and he said, listen, things are gonna get terrible. 
You've walked with me over 40 years and right now you have enough of my presence to, to survive. But if you're going to thrive, you better up your game, boy. You better hear me more. You better pray more. Beloved, listen to me. This is it. God's coming to touch America. How many of you know there's an illness in America beyond political care? Beloved, you all know me. I feel orphaned by both political parties most of the time. Don't even try to classify who I am and what I vote for. You can't. But the fact of the matter, I didn't vote the last election. I just couldn't do it. Now listen to me, beloved. This is it. And it's those who wait on the Lord who run and not grow weary. It's those who wait on the Lord. I so appreciate what happens here on Sunday morning, the worship, the word. But if you're trying to live on that, you're in trouble by Tuesday. You're not meant to. We're just meant to equip you. And if you do what's done here, you'll have power all week. What's done here? You worship, you speak the word, you hear the word, you just do it at home. And yes, there's an amazing corporate dimension, but are you in that place of communion and intimacy? Learning to live under authority. Man, that Joshua was just so mentored. Next is 32, 17 through 19. They're up on the mountain with Moses and Joshua goes, whoa, 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 I hear the sounds of war. Oh, the people are attacked. Moses said, no, son, you hear the sounds of immorality and celebration. They've run them up. That young Joshua lived under authority. In Numbers 11, 28 and 29, some people were prophesying. The elders were breaking out prophesying. Eldad and Medad were prophesying in the camp. Joshua says, oh, they're not leaders. No, they're not. Or oh, he says, son, stop it. Stop being jealous of your position, son. Oh, that all God's people have the anointing. You know, it characterized the life of Caleb and Joshua. They were under the authority of God's word and they were under the authority of God's people. Can I just ask you, what human can stop you? Like, is there any person that can tell you you're wrong? Now, Joshua and Caleb, they grew up rough. They remember when all the Levites came and said, Moses, we're not following you anymore. We're anointed too. Ground opened up and swallowed them. Fire fell down from heaven. And then one of the cruelest things, Aaron, Moses said, Aaron, tell your son to go out there and pick through the human remains and get the censors. Why do you have a child picking through body parts to teach them that God has authority? Beloved, I believe in voluntary authority. No one's going to tell you what to do in this church. But is there anyone you trust to stop you? Is there anyone that can tell you if you raise your kids that way, you may have a prison ministry one day? Is there anyone that can say you're hurting your marriage? Who can speak to you? They line up to speak to me. I have so many. I love Ron Lewis, but there's never been a time I couldn't speak into his life. He couldn't speak into mine. I love Reggie and Bomi. They're under authority. Who can speak to you? God can speak to me. Well, I'm sorry, God has a body. The good news when you get saved is you just got a great father, is, you know, heavenly father, great brother. Bad news is you got a lot of relatives. You may not like them all. Who can stop you? As I look around the body of Christ today, I see great men of God being destroyed not because they didn't listen to God, because they did not listen to the people of God God put in their life. Six, learning to embrace God's way, even when it's not the easy way. We're in Joshua 14, 10 through 12. Caleb's 85 years old. 40 years before, God had promised him Kirith Arba under Moses. That's the city of Arba. Arba was the father of Anak. Anak had multiple sons. They were the meanest, most fierce giants in the promised land. But it was Hebron. It was a covenant city now inhabited by giants. He's 85 years old. And here he says this. Now behold, the Lord's kept me alive. Jesse said these 45 years since the time the Lord spoke this word to Moses. Well, I walked in the wilderness. 
Now behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Maybe his spirit was. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and going and coming. Give me the hill country. Give me the hard place. For you heard on that day how the Anakin were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord has said. Give me the mountain. Give me the hard place. May I tell you, beloved, listen to me. I've preached 50 years. I've been saved almost 60 God's way is seldom the easy way. May I tell you now? Well, why, pastor? Because this is finite. This is nothing. You'll live for eternity. You're only left here to prepare you for eternity and to bring as many as you can with you. He said this. Give me the hard way. There are three types of mountains you're going to face. The easiest is the mountain of promise. Like, if I'll just climb this, I'll see that. I'll see that church. I'll see that thing in my business. I'll see that in my marriage. Makes more, it's a fight, it's worth it. Then there's the mountain of purpose. Well, I just know it's my purpose. Then there's the worst one. It's the mountain of pain. Just makes no sense. You're just fighting for the life of someone you love. A child lays dying. A child wanders off and all of a sudden you're in a mountain where you're just climbing in deep pain. Where are you when the mountain comes? Where are you when you're in the mountain range of hell? It's one mountain after another. Some years ago, I saw something coming on my life. It was going to be terrible. I just knew it. I fell to my face. I said, God, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, so be it, I beg you. But if not, I will drink it to the dredge for your glory. There's always mountains. I love that song about he'll move the mountains. You know, that's just not all the time. There's some mountains you climb and some mountains you move. And why you're bitter is you couldn't figure out the difference. You know what the bad news is? I've climbed more than I've moved. Yes, Kathy was healed. She should be dead. Yes, I lay dying and God healed me. I should be dead. I, I wish it was always that simple. It's not. Can you say today, give me that mountain. If my inheritance involves that mountain, so be it. It's someone else's inheritance that I love. I've never shied from the mountains. I've lived climbing in most of my life now. This is reality. It's where we live. It's the truth. Learning to walk in the miraculous power of God. A fresh wave of his power is coming. Joshua 3, 1 through 5, he said, listen, Consecrate yourselves. You'll see great things tomorrow. Just follow the presence of God. Follow the ark and watch. I tell you, Kings Park, consecrate yourselves. Greater things are coming. You follow that presence. You follow that spirit. Follow it and see what God does. I want you to stand to your feet. I'm going to close with something. Pastor Reggie, join me up here, please. I took some time off this year. I'm faithful to take a little five or six day vacations, but I took a couple months off. First time in 33 years. And I'd gotten tired, faced a lot of crisis, um, some tragedy in our extended family. And on June 9th, the Lord was allowing me to pray again a bit at night, and he came to me, and in a vision, I saw Jesus walking across America, trudging, dust in his feet, sorrow, eyes tearing up and the next thing I knew I heard him praying to his father please father please father please father one more time 
one more time, one more time. I was, my gosh, he's praying for an outpouring of the Spirit. One more time, one more time. And I heard him say from heaven, one more time. I saw the first giant raindrop fall from heaven. We're in the early moments of God sweeping our nation in the world. It's just true. I know it's not easy. I know it's hard right now. I know it is, beloved. And I'm sorry for it, but it is the reality. And here we stand, Kings Park, on the cusp of a move of the Holy Spirit. On the cusp of a move of the Holy Spirit. Play injured. I don't mean don't get counseling. I don't mean don't get healed. But don't wait to be healed. Learn to live by faith. Yes. Learn to live under the authority of the word. Learn that God's way is normally not the easy way. I wish it was. Here we stand. Holy Spirit, I thank you for my Kings Park family. Thank you for their work in their life, your spirit in their life. And I call them into everything you have for them. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you have questions or prayer requests, please email us at info at kingspark.org or message us on one of our social media channels. If you would like to give, you can do so by visiting kingspark.org slash giving or by downloading the Kings Park app.